today we're going to be talking about the queue. Now, if you've missed the previous few episodes or just want a refresher on the information we've covered so far, you can click the card on the top right corner or the link in the description. They'll both take you to a playlist containing all the episodes in our Introduction to Data Structure series so far. All right, so now that we've talked about the stack, a sequential access data structure which follows the LIFO principle, we need to cover the opposite, which in computer science we call a queue. A queue is a sequential access data structure which follows the FIFO principle, which we'll be covering later. The stack and queue are very much a dynamic duo when it comes to the world of computer science, so you'll notice a lot of similarities between the two in the way they're structured and how they work. Today, we're going to start with some background information on the queue, then dive into how we actually create queues. From there, we'll discuss some common queue methods used to interact and modify it, and of course then we'll talk about its big O notation time complexity equations before finally going over some common uses for the queue in computer science in the real world. The timestamps on your screen now will take you to the point in the video where we discuss each of these topics, so feel free to skip around. For those of you sticking around though, let's start with the million dollar question, which is what exactly is a queue? Well, a queue, like the stack, is a sequential access data structure, meaning we can only access the elements contained within it a certain way. Now, if you remember back to stacks, this certain way was the LIFO methodology, or last in, first out where the last element pushed onto the stack would be the first one we popped off, similar to a stack of books that we add to and remove from. In contrast, the queue follows what's known as the FIFO methodology, or first in first out, where the first element added to the queue will always be the first one to be removed. We can think of this as a line to your favorite amusement park ride. The first person to get there, assuming we don't have any cutters, will always be the first one who gets to go on the ride. The later you show up, the longer you'll have to wait to get onto the ride. This is the strategy used for queues when adding and removing elements. The first element to be added will also be the first one to be removed. Another big difference between stacks and queues is the location we add and remove elements from. You might remember that with the stack, we added and removed elements from one spot, the top. With the queue though, this is different. We add elements to the back and we remove them from the front. And if you think about it, this makes complete sense. If we're getting in line for a roller coaster or an amusement park ride, we don't get in line at the front, we get in line at the back. And then as people get on the ride, we slowly move up to the line until we reach the front, and then we're allowed on. Queues act in the same way. We add elements to the back, also known as the tail of the queue, and then remove them from the front, also known as the head of the queue. This allows us to make sure that we 100% follow the FIFO methodology. So there's your background information on the queue. Sequential access, FIFO methodology, add elements to the back and remove them from the front. Got it? Okay. Now we're gonna dive headfirst into how we actually create a queue because just knowing about them isn't going to help us use them. So shown on your screen now are three ways to initialize a queue in Java, Python, and C Sharp. You'll notice it looks almost identical to the way we initialized a stack. We start by involving the queue name in Java and C Sharp to let the computer know we want to make a queue. Then, in Java's case, we include the type of queue we're creating, in this case, a queue of strings. From there, we just add a name for the queue in all languages. I just called it example queue because that's what it is. And then finally, in Java and C Sharp, we set it equal to new queue with a set of parentheses. In Java's case, we also have to include a uh, respecification that it's a queue of strings, and in Python we actually just set it equal to a set of brackets, but that really just comes down to language preferences and the fact that Python is just weird. Again, we don't include a size for the queue in the parentheses like we do for arrays, because its size will be dynamically updated as we add and remove elements throughout our program. Alright, let's take this example queue we've just made and talk about some common queue methods. So just like the stack, we're going to have two methods used to add and remove elements from the queue. For the stack, we added elements with push and removed them with pop. For the queue, we add elements using on queue and remove them using dq. In addition to these two, we're also going to be covering peak and contains, which if you watch the previous segment should look pretty familiar. On queue is the method we use to add elements to the tail of the queue. It takes in an object to put at the end of the queue and simply adds that object while also increasing the size of the queue by one. Let's pull up our example queue, which you can see has a size of zero. But if we called onQueue on a completely random string, let's just say now, 
the string would be added to the back and the size would increase by one. Now because there's only one element in the queue at this point, the string now is acting as both the head and the tail for us. Let's fix that by on queuing a few more completely random strings. If we add video, the size goes to two. We can add this and it goes to three. Like makes it four, you get the idea. Now we have a fully functional queue where if we wanted to remove these elements for any reason, we could do so in exactly the same order we added them. Pretty neat. Speaking of removing these elements, that takes us perfectly into our next method, DQ. DQ is the method we use to remove elements from the head of our queue. It doesn't take in any arguments and will just return the element that was removed from the queue back to the user. So if we ran a DQ command on our example queue, you'd see that now is returned back to the user and also removed from the queue, as well as the size has been decreased by one. If we run it again, video is returned and removed from the queue, the size went down by one, you get the idea. We could keep doing this for every element in the list until it's empty, but the next methods we're going to talk about need some information to work with, so for now let's keep the queue filled with its original elements. The next method I want to discuss with you guys is peak. Now we've actually already talked about peak in our episode on stacks, but if you forget or just didn't watch that, peak returns the object that's at the forefront of our queue. It doesn't take in any arguments and will simply just return the foremost object of the queue without actually removing it. The key word there being without. This method allows you to look at the top of the queue before you actually dequeue it. Maybe to make sure the element you're about to dequeue is the correct one, or check to see if an element that you need is still there, etc, etc. Whatever the case is, you can use the peak method to do so. If we were to run it on our example queue, you'd see that now is returned back to the user. But if we dequeue the first two elements and run it again, you'll see that this is returned. Pretty simple, but extremely effective. Again, let's add video and now back into the queue for our next method. The final method we'll cover today for queues is the contains method. The name pretty much says it all. It takes in an object and will return whether or not the queue contains that object. Running it on our example stack with an argument of queue would return false because as you can tell there is no queue string in our queue. However, if we ran it on a string like uh, let's say video, it returned true because as you can see, video is in the queue. Not mind blowing, but it's definitely important to know if you're going to be using queues. And there they are all together now. On queue, DQ, peak, and contains. Four methods which will help you use a queue to its maximum efficiency. Speaking of efficiency, let's now talk about the time complexity equations for a queue. Now accessing an element within a queue is going to be O of n. This is because let's say you had some queue full of three elements. If you want the object at the tail, you first have to dequeue every element off the front until the one you want is at the head of the queue. Then and only then can you actually get the value contained within that. Since this may require you to go through the entire queue, accessing is O of n. This is because, again, queues are sequential access data structures and not random access data structures. This means we can't simply just grab an element from the middle of the queue, that's just not how things work. Now searching is going to be O of n for the same exact reason. Trying to find an element contained at the tail of the queue requires you to iterate across that entire queue to check for it. So in that scenario, we have to check every element within that queue of size n, making the time complexity O of n. Now inserting and deleting to and from a queue are both going to be an instantaneous O of 1, because just like with the stack, we're only ever on queuing at a single point, and we're only ever dequeuing at a single point. Meaning it's never going to matter how large the size of the queue is, it'll be the same number of operations for any magnitude. And there they are in all their glory, the time complexity equations for the queue. You'll notice that they're identical to the stack, which if you've been paying attention is the truth for most properties of a queue. They're very much a yin and yang, one and the same type deal. You'll oftentimes see them talked about together frequently just because of how similar their functionality is. Alright, now the final thing I want to cover is just some common uses for a queue within programming. What are these things actually used for? And the answer is, quite honestly, a lot. Queues are used for what's known as job scheduling, in which the computer determines which tasks to complete for the user and when, like opening up a web page or a computer program. It's also used in printers to keep track of when multiple users try and print to figure out whose documents get printed first. 
Heck, even Google uses cues in their new Pixel phones to enable what's known as zero shutter lag, in which they strategically use cues to eliminate the time between when you take a picture and what the phone actually captures. So yeah, in conclusion, the cue is pretty great and is used in much of the technology you interact with every day. And now that you've made it to the end of this video, you have all the tools needed to harness that power. This also concludes our discussion on the queue, a sequential access data structure which follows the FIFO principle to add elements to the back and remove elements from the front. Up next, we'll continue with sequential access and talk about one of my personal favorite data structures, the linked list. But until then, peace. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. These videos can sometimes take quite a while to research, script out, and create visuals for, not to mention the audio recording and editing process. In total, these episodes can take up to 12 hours start to finish, so we appreciate you sticking around to the end. If you like this type of content and want it delivered to your subscription box free of charge, click the link on the right of your screen now to subscribe to the channel. As an added bonus, if you click the bell next to the subscribe button, we'll tell the big ups at YouTube to notify you when a new video is uploaded for no additional fee. And if you can't wait that long and are craving more of my melodic voice, you can click the playlist on the left of your screen now, which will take you to a playlist containing more programming fun. Until next time, peace.